Coming up, Sky Eagle Collection takes on New York Fashion Week. Native representation on corporate boards is rare. The Forest Service strengthens nation-to-nation -nation relations. Plus, All My Relations Gallery builds community. And we meet a father who carries on the hoop dance tradition. I am Mackenzie Allen Charmley. Join us for these interviews and more on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. This is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Chinangale, we're so glad you could join us. Sky Eagle Collection is an avant-garde native fashion brand headed for New York Fashion Week. Dante Bis Grayson is its co-founder and designer. Let's watch an interview with this Osage artist and veteran. My brand, the uh, Sky Eagle Collection, uh, will be showing a uh, you know a series of new native fashion, native avant-garde. It's going to be great. It's uh, not a lot of native designers uh, make it to those spaces and those platforms, so it's nice to be able to uh, you know represent and also remind everybody out there that we're still here and that we can also compete on these big stages. Did you envision your brand in a space like this, and where do you see it going in the future now that you've made it to this point? So I have a lot of uh, strategic planning as far as like goals, the long term, like five years, 10 years, where I want to uh, scale up certain parts of the brand. Uh, I'm going to branch out into, um, you know, uh, like ranch wear. I'm also going to be doing uh, media consultations uh, for other uh, companies on how to grow and also how to build a brand. Um, also cold weather gear, like ski weather. But uh, the big goal is that I know it's pretty bold, but, uh, you know, I, I was born in Santa Fe and Tom Ford, uh, you know, lived there. Uh, I, I'd love to be the first global uh, native and veteran owned uh, fashion brand that is, you know, shoulder to shoulder with Gucci. So I'm going to aim high. I like that. What are you most excited for people to see from Sky Eagle Collection um, during this time in New York? Uh, New York is going to be, uh, there's so many things going on. Um, I'd say the, the main area is uh, the native avant-garde. Uh, for, for fashion, I, I've, I've, the brand kind of focuses on what is like new native warriors, men and women in these different spaces, you know, in boardrooms, uh, as, as state representatives. Uh, leaders, teachers, doctors, that type of thing. And so the, the brand has clothing, uh, you know, native uh, design from, from my tribe, from the Plains uh, ribbon work. And then I made it real modern and deconstructed certain things. So like, for instance, like this tie, you know, uh, it's, it's something that uh, these new warriors can be honored to wear and also feel empowered in, in these spaces that they're uh, they're representing. So yeah, that, that'll be the main thing. And also in New York, uh, I have a lot of trench coats. Um, also just have a few surprises as well. I'm doing some uh, kind of real abstract pieces. So, so more to follow on that. Your experience as a veteran and the MMIW epidemic were big inspirations for your brand. Could you tell us about the relationship between your designs um, and the issues native communities face? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the brand started, you know, my daughter, uh, we're both Eagle Clan, and I wanted to, you know, as a first son in a Lompa in my tribe, um, also Eagle Clan being uh, a leader, protector of the family, the tribe, the nation. Um, so I looked at her, my daughter, and, you know, I, I, I came back from overseas, the military and all that, and uh, found out about the MMIW ep epidemic. And I'm like, you know, I, we need to do something about this. And it expanded more into all of the issues that are impacting uh, Indian country. Um, 
lack of access to education, health care, um, and the outcomes and all that, a lot of high rate of suicide, a lot of different things. And so, like, I decided, <clears throat> what can I do about it? So that's one core pillar of the brand is, is social justice. Build a platform, you know, uh, e-commerce, media, social media, whatever, uh, to be able to bring awareness to a, an issue uh, and then also to inspire action. So a lot of people who, who you know, uh, support Sky Eagle uh, wearing these clothing in these spaces so that they say, okay, you know, we can go out there and, and take action to uh, mitigate these issues. That was designer Dante Grayson. Fashion is a big business represented by many corporations. But who has a voice in these companies? Mark Trahant finds out. Let's take a look. There are not many stores that are more high dollar than Saks Fifth Avenue. It's a little Hollywood, New York, all glitz. But there is another story, one about colonization. Think about your day. We are all surrounded by corporate influences. Companies tell us what's good to eat, where we should shop, or how to save our money. Then it's been that way for a long time. And that brings us back to Saks. It's owned by one of the first corporations to trade with indigenous people, Hudson's Bay, a company that opened its doors in 1607. These companies have been selling to us for a long time. But what if indigenous people were included? What if we had representation in this framework? You see, corporations, like governments, have a structure, and that includes a board of directors. These are the men and a few women who are legally obligated to run those companies. And in five centuries, few indigenous people have been invited to a seat at that table. In Chicago, Mary Smith, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, is changing that narrative. Well, I'm a lawyer and I focused on corporate governance for a lot of my career and also highly regulated industries. And so a few years back, I started wanting to be on corporate boards, but I find it really fascinating and interesting and hope that I'm making a difference too, because as a board member, you're helping set a direction for a company and an organization um, and help them overcome their challenges and um, you know, hopefully help people. There are some 4,000 companies traded on Wall Street. Each has a professional board member who is responsible for corporate governance. The number of American Indians and Alaska Natives represented on those boards is far less than one-tenth of one percent. Smith has the resume for this type of post. She is an attorney and she has been the chief executive officer for the U.S. Indian Health Service, a six billion dollar a year operation. I mean, I think uh, for most people, uh, you're not going to get a call out of the blue. I mean, some people do, but I think you have to put yourself out there and, first of all, ask yourself, why do I want to be on a corporate board? Um, and what value will I bring? And then also put yourself out there so that people know that you want to be on a corporate board because there are recruiters that recruit for corporate boards, but um, the vast majority of board seats are still um, uh, filled through networking. Smith is on the board for PTC Therapeutics, Inc. It's a publicly traded global biopharmaceutical company that helps provide medicine to patients with rare disorders. This is a job, and she has paid more than $30,000 a year to serve, according to the company's report with the Securities and Exchange Commission. On top of that, she has awarded both options and stocks that depend on the success of the company. These together could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, $30,000 is a lot of money. It's not as much as the average board seat. According to the search firm Spencer Stewart's annual report, the total average compensation for a board seat is $312,000 per year. This type of compensation shows that serving on a corporate board is a good gig. Yet the number of indigenous people who hold such seats is really tiny. But this is a moment when that could be changing. More regulators are asking companies to show they are recruiting and appointing diverse directors. More regulators are asking companies to show how they are recruiting and appointing diverse directors. And more investors are judging companies based on their diversity and inclusion results. 
Assemblyman James Ramos serves in the California legislature and he explains the logic of this law. It's very important to have representation, especially from the Native American community, because it, it, it serves as, as two different folds. One, to make sure that representation um, of not only California's first people, but the nation's first people has a voice in driving the economics of our communities and of our state and of our nation. And there is another important lesson. Boards are appointed from a network of other board members. So for hundreds of years, white men looked around and appointed each other, white men, people they knew. Now that net is being cast wider because people like Mary Smith have their own networks. I would love to see more Native Americans on boards and um, I hope that, that some of some people would start to say, yeah, I could do that, and then try to um, put themselves out there to be on the radar for people being on board. The challenge for corporate boards is to get beyond their usual suspects, to look for the talent pool that is Indian country. In Chicago, I'm Mark Trahant for ICT Newscast. Many lands held sacred by tribes are controlled by the U.S. Forest Service. ICT Shirley Snavy interviewed Chief Randy Moore about tribal consultation. There's a renewed interest in trying to work with the tribes. You know, we've uh, put together a, a tribal action plan. Uh, we've also had personal visits, myself and the undersecretary, out to Indian country up in the North and South Dakota. Uh, we have a couple of other meetings scheduled for this week. So we're really trying to renew uh, and even uh, escalate, if you will, that level of interest in tribal issues and concerns. I think what you'll see is us enter into a lot more uh, agreements like the shared stewardship agreements, uh, where we are uh, sharing leadership and co-managing in some cases. And, and, and so I think you'll see um, a lot of those things taking place now. As a matter of fact, we have about 11 our shared stewardship agreements now. We have another 60 or so that's in the works. Uh, I think 40 or so that's in the works uh, that we're trying to work through now. And what that demonstrates is a real commitment that this administration has toward working with the tribes. Ultimately, you know, we have to do a better job of, first of all, being educated about what some of the tribal interests are. And, you know, we, we can talk about these types of things, but it's different when you go and you spend a week with the tribes riding around in the truck, listening to the concerns and the interests. And the Undersecretary Wilkes and I did just that a couple months back, and it gave us a level of, of understanding that we would not have gotten by sitting at this desk here in Washington, D.C., or just attending meetings here and there. It's really going out on the ground and, and really understanding ultimately what is it that many of the tribes want and they want their land back. While I cannot give them the land back, we can do everything we can within our power to work with the tribes to make sure that we are an inclusive organization, making sure that we are including the tribes and not only uh, uh, how we uh, manage uh, these lands, but how should we be managing these lands? You know, looking at the tribal, traditional tribal practices, for example, uh, when you look at the 10 year strategy on uh, wildfire reduction, you know, it's really how do we restore prescribed fire back to the landscape in these fire adapted ecosystems that the tribes was doing great with many, many years before uh, this country became known as America. And so I, I do think there are lessons learned from tr traditional tribal practices and when you integrate that with the science, I'm just excited about what the possibilities are going forward. Uh, if you take the western part of the U.S., and if you look at the conditions that the landscapes are in now, uh, we want to put fire back on the landscape, but we know that we also have to remove some of the thick vegetation that's on the landscapes now. And so while we're developing this plan, what better way than to sit down with the tribes now, to say, what is it that we're trying to achieve and how do we maintain it once we achieve it? And this is where I think the tribes could have a monumental role in what happens on these lands that they care so much about as well as us caring about them too. And so, you know, Shirley, I think what you'll see is a, a, just a, a genuineness um, for including the tribes and in how we manage these lands. I think what you'll see is a genuineness of us being uh, inclusive uh, as we go about. Now, 
I I understand too. You know, we're we're doing a lot in this past year, year and a half. We, we've been doing a lot, but we also have a lot more to do. We have a lot more to understand, and we don't understand it yet. And it's one thing for me as the chief to say that this is what we are intending to do. It's another thing when you look at the organization all the way down to the ground level, making sure that we all have the same level of understanding, making sure that we all have that same level of commitment to make a difference in what we're doing out there, what our intents are. Uh, we're looking at some uh, new opportunities uh, up on the grasslands in the Dakotas now, and particularly with the Lakotas. And so I think you'll see a lot of those kinds of agreements coming to fruition uh, this year. You know, it's, it's interesting for me, and, and that's why I said, you know, you know, it's one thing to to even study about it and, and to sit in meetings and learn about it. It's totally different going out on the ground, riding over that ground with some of the tribes who has a tradition and has a history of those lands. For me, it was really educational to look at the beginnings of those lands being reservations, only to be not reservations, only to be turned into grasslands, uh, federal grasslands. And so I think that we have uh, an obligation and a responsibility, and we also have the opportunity to share in how those grasslands are being managed. And so we're looking at trying to figure out how can we move forward uh, in a more inclusive manner that, that are uh, engaging with the tribes and including the tribes on how we might co-manage some of these uh, same lands. You know, it's one thing for me to say something, but I would encourage you to monitor um, the actions that we take going forward over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, our intentions are good, but but you know, if if there's no fruition to the intentions, then the intentions are worthless. And so I I just would say uh, stand by and uh, be ready to engage with us. Uh, help us to learn the traditional values and methods that have meant so much to you and many other tribes through the years. That was Forest Service Chief Randy Moore. When we come back, a unique Minneapolis gallery brings community together. Stay with us. When indigenous people leave their homelands for the city, how do they find connections to culture? For many years, urban Indians in Minneapolis have gravitated towards the Phillips neighborhood and Franklin Avenue. The American Indian Cultural Corridor is home to All My Relations Arts Gallery. Director Angela Two Stars tells us more. The American Indian Cultural Corridor um, is the, um, the most dense uh, area of urban American Indians in Minneapolis. Um, our gallery is located directly on Franklin Avenue, and we are a kind of cultural hotspot um, that lifts, uplifts and promotes um, a contemporary American Indian art on Franklin Avenue. We're a cultural destination, a tourist destination in the Twin Cities. And what kind of art shows does All My Relations feature? We have a variety of art. Our purpose, our mission is to uplift the strength of contemporary American Indian artists. And so we do that through a variety of exhibitions that highlight solo artists, uh, group exhibitions, all around topics that are important and relevant to American Indian people. Um, issues around like identity, um, culture, language, family, you know, everything that is important to our community and the American Indian uh, culture at large is what we highlight in our exhibitions. And artists just have a way of sharing these important messages um, through their artwork that the general audience can able to um, embrace and understand and learn about who we are as American Indian people. And what kind of partnerships help bring the arts to life in your area? We have a variety of partnerships. Right now we're working with Hennepin Theater Trust on a large scale public art um, cohort called the We Are Still Here cohort. This year we're featuring three artists along with a mentor artist who are working on mural design. And that allows this group of artists to learn the skills and techniques of working in mural art. And that is to share that uh, visibility of American Indian people through artworks on large scale um, public facades along Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis and to the American Indian Cultural Corridor. 
We've also had partnerships um, with the Minnesota Department of Transportation and other organizations that come to us um, looking to share knowledge of the American Indian people in the Twin Cities uh, with their audiences. And so we do a lot of like cross pollination of our audience bases. I know in the past you've worked with writers. Could you touch more on that? Yes, we have a great program um, in progress right now. It's called the Native Authors Program, and this is our second year that we've been hosting this group of artists, um, again, led by a, a, a experienced Native author. This year is Art Colson. Our first group was led by Diane Wilson, and these are established, seasoned Native writers. And our goal is to provide opportunity, training, and support to Native writers and using the same um, processes that we've done to support Native artists because our goal is to have more Native writers telling our stories and having more Native writers becoming published writers. And tell us how the pandemic changed your work and the way that you do business today. Well, the pandemic, um, you know, we all were, started to work remotely and really focused on our internal health as an organization. A lot of our work was focused on um, supporting, right? So, sorry, excuse me, supporting artists because the pandemic impacted artists so much. In Minneapolis, we were dealing with a dual pandemic, which was, you know, the, the COVID-19, but also the social uprisings after the murder of George Floyd. And so our gallery itself actually ended up becoming a, a hub for donations that came in after the uprisings during that period of time. And we really worked to support artists in the community and responding to what they needed at the time and just transitioning ourselves to what the community was needing from our organization and also taking care of ourselves, um, focusing on self-care. I think it was a big thing within our organization of making sure that we were all getting through that difficult period together. You yourself are an artist. Tell us about your work. Yes, uh, I actually am a practicing public artist. Um, I have a piece in the Walker Art Center um, has, I'm sorry, the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden has my uh, piece called Okchiapi, which is a tribute to my Dakota language. I'm currently in the middle of installing an exhibition that opens up this Saturday at St. Catharines University, and it's called Reconnected, which is sharing the story of how reconnecting with the Dakota language for myself has been part of my own healing journey and sharing that message with the audience that's coming to view my work and just reinforcing uh, the vitality of Dakota language and how that translates to other tribal communities who are also working in language revitalization and how important that is to our, our cultural healing. That was Angela Two Stars in Minneapolis. Phoenix is home to the World Hoop Dancing Competition. The Duncan family has been carrying on the tradition for decades. Mark Trahant interviewed Ken Duncan about the family's involvement in the dance. I taught my, my sons, um, all of my sons and my grandchildren how to hoop dance. I used to be a hoop dancer, but um, I was building an Apache wiki up at Indian Summer Festival in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin one night and I fell off a ladder and I have a very bad back now. And so after I couldn't dance anymore, I decided to teach all of my sons and many of them I've been very happy to say that they uh, have taken a title and they've placed uh, most of the time, second, third, fourth, whatever. But um, hoop dancing is very much a part of our, our family activities. I was taught to hoop dance uh, while I was attending uh, Brigham Young University by one of the dancers, and he is still competing in the seniors division. His name is Terry Godell. And with a group from there, we toured throughout the world hoop dancing until I left the university. And when I came to Phoenix, I taught all of my boys how to hoop dance. And so we have not missed a hoop dance contest, I believe, since its in inception at the Hurt Museum. How, how has it changed over the years? What have you seen with that? Um, when I first arrived to Phoenix back in the early 80s, when my boys were just 
two, three years old, um, throughout the whole valley, even in the whole state, I believe, there were maybe two or three hoop dancers. And they were very rare. And uh, it was um, uh, Dennis Alley's, um, the well-known uh, singer's sons that were the only hoop dancers that I was aware of. But now, uh, to this date, there are so many hoop dancers. I mean, there's hoop dancers everywhere. And so it's, it's become very popular from the 80s to now. Hoop dancing carries a spiritual meaning. Uh, what does that mean for you? Hoop dancing, we all believe, uh, is that it originated from the Taos Pueblo with a gentleman by the name of Tony White Cloud that made it very popular. He toured internationally as a hoop dancer with a dance company. He took it out of Taos Pueblo. And so after that, a lot of people caught on to hoop dancing and so he uh, is the one that popularized the whole idea of hoop dancing. And a lot of Indian tribes uh, throughout Canada and the U.S. have uh, picked up on hoop dancing. And now it seems to be in all of North America. That was Ken Duncan. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.